Hello everybody, this is Tim. Uh, I'm finally here to do my review for Friday the 13th. Obviously, I'm going to start with the first film. Decided to bring out my DVD of Friday the 13th. It's supposed to be uncut. But uh, to be honest, I didn't notice any fucking differences in this movie. I mean, un in the uncut version. But uh, it's also the deluxe edition. It comes with commentary by the director with cast and crew. Uh, fresh cuts, new tales from Friday the 13th. The man behind the legacy, Sean S. Cunningham, the director. Uh, the Fire 13th Reunion and Lost Tales from Camp Blood Part 1 and, of course, the trailer. Decent special features, the commentary, it's alright. The different people from the film chime in, which I enjoyed that. But uh, I have all these films on deluxe editions. I would have to say the commentary on this one, though, isn't one of my favorites, but I still think it's pretty good. Uh, to get down to this film here, this is a really good film. I'll just go ahead and give my rating. It's a four-star film out of possible four. Uh, to jump right into the film, um, it takes a lot from Halloween. Uh, and at the time, I believe they just wanted to capitalize on the success of Halloween or make a film similar to that since Halloween had been so successful in theaters. But the film has a, uh, a lot of differences in it that make it uh, a different enough film to Halloween to where it can be enjoyed uh, as its own film and not looked at as like a ripoff of Halloween or anything like that. Because Halloween took inspiration from other films and every film is partially inspired by other stuff that came before it. So this film is no different. Uh, but anyway... This is a really good film, and uh, I know at the time it came out back in the 80s, in 1980, I believe. Uh, critics hated this film. They hated it. But <laughs> critics hate every fucking horror film except for the ones that uh, try to be more suspenseful or the ones that are labeled, quote-unquote, thrillers. <laughs> but uh, I get critics, I, they just hate every horror film, even thrillers. Most of the time they give those a hard time, too. But uh, fuck critics. I mean, they... <laughs> Even though I agree with them sometimes, they don't really, they seem like they don't know jack shit about um, horror films in general or like what is a horror film or what makes a good horror film. For some reason, I don't know why they don't understand what a horror film is or why they should exist. I don't know. But anyway, no friend on this film here. Uh, Friday the 13th, it's a great title for a horror movie. <laughs> Terrific little setup there with that title. Jump into the film. Uh, it starts out on a camp. We get a great setting with the woods. It plays off really well here. Critics complained about this film being, I guess, too graphic at the time or whatever. But watching it now, it seems really tame. Well, I don't know about... Well, I mean, it's got a lot of blood and guts in it and the makeup effects in it. The kills are done by Tom Savini and they're done really well. But what I mean by tame is that there's a lot more suspense in this film. I think critics back in the day gave it credit for it. There's a lot. There's like at least three off-screen kills. But, um... The kills we, that are in the movie are still played great, and the suspense in the movie is really good, which is why I think this film is the best in this franchise. It's not as good as the original Halloween, but it's pretty close. Uh, it is better than any of the sequels to Halloween, though, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, this is a great horror film and a classic. This film and, uh, well, uh, Jason, uh, Freddy Krueger, and Michael Myers are pretty much like the holy horror trinity <laughs> to me for the 80s. But, um... Yeah, uh, to the plot of this film here, the beginning of the film, you get the woods, you get the setting, you get some camp counselors singing kumbaya shit, uh, two of them go off to fuck, um, you get POV shots with the killer, like, coming in up on them, uh, the guy gets stabbed in the gut, decent kill, the makeup effects look really good, uh, the girl just kind of looks at the camera and goes, ah, <laughs> and then it just kind of freezes, but it's still cool, especially for the 80s, I love, I love the feel of these older horror films like this, and, how original Halloween and Nightmare on Elm Street just have more grungy feel to them that are just more of like a low budget look and feel to them that makes them feel more real than the more polished look and stuff like that of Platinum Dunes which is like the, the fucking company that was sole purpose of existence is to cash in on other older horror films I, I call them Platinum Cash In to be honest <laughs> I hate all their remakes I hate them I hate them all but uh and so after that, you get like the coolest fucking title sequence for an 80s movie I've ever seen. Where the Friday the 13th, like the title pops up and comes flying directly towards the screen and fucking breaks like glass, like a window or something. It's really simple. It's a really simple effect, but it's just so cool. And just gets you straight into the film that this is just going to be a balls busting in your face slasher film. That's not going to fuck around, which I enjoy. Uh, and then, uh, the film skips to present time at that time, which was 1980. We get a character uh, of Annie. Who is trying to get a ride to Camp Crystal Lake? Camp Crystal Lake is the lake where the two people were murdered at the beginning of the film. Um, there's been a lot of incidences at this camp, like fires and shit, and somebody pulls in the water, and it's like obviously somebody doesn't want this camp reopened. Um, 
But uh, the locals in the town call the place Camp Blood. It's the nickname for the town. Uh, so Annie comes there. She wants to get a ride to the camp. They're reopening it, reopening it again, and she's going to be the cook there. She gets a ride, and this truck driver, I, mean, I swear, and well, it's, it's obvious that he like goes for an ass grab when he helps her in the side of the truck. He's like helping her in the vehicle, and he like totally grabs her ass like right there when he's pushing her up to the vehicle. I just thought that was funny. I just noticed that. I noticed little things like that. I just find funny. And you get crazy Ralph, this guy, this old man in the film who pops up in the town and keeps saying, "You go on the camp, blood, ain't you?" You'll never come back again. <laughs> He's entertaining. <laughs> that that actor is, does a good job. All the actors in this film are perfect and good for this kind of film. Um, but yeah, he does great. <laughs> He's very likable and fun to watch. Later on in the movie, he pops up at the, actually at the camp and is warning the people there. He <laughs> telling them to leave that they're doomed if they stay there. And they're like, uh, they're like, who are you? And he's like, God sent me. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is this is rules at this point. But anyway, uh, so she's heading to the camp. Uh, the truck driver drops her off on the side of the road. She's getting ready to, she's still trying to hitch a ride. She gets picked up in this Jeep. Obviously, it's the killer. You get a POV shot. You don't know who the killer is at this point. Um, uh, he's, uh, well, she's getting drove in the, in the Jeep. And, uh, they pass up Camp Crystal Lake. Uh, obviously, the Jeep is speeding. <laughs> so she decides to fucking leap out. She knows something's up. She jumps out, makes it into the woods. But her leg is hurt from the jump. And then we get a cool death scene here. This is probably one of my faves in the movie. Just because of all the little build up and the wood chasing. And this is like. I just love the effect. <laughs> and she's standing there and all at once the killer. You don't get to see the killer's look. And he comes towards him like this. And like moves really quick with a knife. And like slices like that. You don't see the killer's face or the, or the look of the killer or whatever. And uh, and it cuts back to the to Annie. And her fucking throat is slit. Coming from the blood's like gushing down like that. It just looks so cool, and the effects in this film still hold up today. Some of them are a tad bit dated, but I guess a good 99% of these effects still hold up today and look really good. Uh, so she's dead. No, no more Annie. I heard that they tried to make her character kind of like the Janet Lee in Psycho, like you thought that she was going to be the lead. But to be honest, I never thought that at all when I watched this film. So they kind of failed a little bit on that point. But the rest of this film more than makes up for it. any little nitpicks in this film are more than made up for by the kills and just the sheer the suspense of this film, which I think this film has decent suspense in it. There is suspense and thrilling shit in this movie. So I don't know what critics' deal is. I guess this film was like really gory and graphic for the time, but <laughs> I think they kind of overlooked all the well-crafted suspense and uh, directing in this film and just focus on the graphicness of it, which the graphicness of it is cool. It's a fucking slasher film. What do you expect? But uh, I think they just kind of overlooked that stuff just so they can nitpick at the film on purpose. Just like every now and then you get a film where critics just hate it deliberately just because it – if this film wouldn't have made a lot of money, I don't think critics would have been as hard on it because it was a huge hit. They were just like, oh, this is so demoralizing of society, and I'm like, oh, fuck you. What? It's like critics always try to look for a deeper meaning in every film ever made for some reason. I don't know why. But whatever. <clears throat> Kevin Bacon in this film, I think it was his first role. I like Kevin Bacon, he's a good actor. I liked him in Tremors uh, and a bunch of other shit. Uh, <laughs> he's gonna be one of the camp counselors, or uh, him and his girlfriend. Then you get this character called Ned, who's like the practical joker. He's he's funny every now and then, but he kind of fucking annoyed me. So I, I was kind of rooting for him to die, to be honest. He's really obnoxious. Uh, but uh, so they're heading to the camp. Uh, at the camp, you get this guy named Steve Christie. Uh, he's uh, the owner of the camp. He's trying to reopen the camp and fix it up for the summer, and that's what he's got the counselors there for to help get uh, get the place in shape and get get into their roles as counselors. And you got a character there by the name of Alice, who's the hero of the film. Um, uh, I believe Adrian Adriana King plays this uh, plays this character. She does fine. She's decently likable. They kind of hint at a relationship between her and Steve Christie, the owner of the camp. They don't really dwell on anything. I would have liked a little bit more information on that shit, but you don't get that. But once again, the kills and everything like that more than make up for any little character faults. Which the characters, you get enough information on to where they're likable. These do seem like real teenagers and real kids. I mean, they seem like real people. This, the stuff they do kind of seems like what teenagers, what teenagers would really do in this situation. <laughs> so I like that. Um... Some movies you get, like horror films, you get where they try to like, it's like people don't know how to write teenagers, so they try to pull it out of their ass, and I'm like, okay, like what teenagers would do, kind of like in the Friday the 13th remake, or, or reboot, or reimagining, or refuck, or whatever, where they're like playing 
fucking ping pong and drinking beer out of a shoe. And I'm like, who the fuck does that? But whatever, maybe I'm just behind on the times of day. Maybe that's a cool game for teens nowadays to drink beer out of a shoe or liquor or whatever. But anyway, um, back to the film here. Uh, so you get them, they're there fixing up the camp, uh, they get great uh, POV shots of the killer all through the movie that I really enjoy, you don't know who the killer is, he tries to play up the mystery a little bit, you get the character named Bill in the film, who's like, he's got the hots for Alice too, I guess, <laughs> along with Steve Christie who also has the hots for <clears throat> he like fucking kills this snake in a funny scene, <laughs> where it's, there's a snake in Alice's cabin and he fucking like cuts it with a machete and he, he leans back and puts it on his shoulder like that and he's just kind of giving it a look like, yeah, I'm a badass. <laughs> but anyway, they try to play up the mystery a little bit, uh, who's the killer, but they don't really dwell on it or anything that much. But like I said, it doesn't hurt it at all because I like their suspense in here and I like the, the actors. Um, and I like the death scenes a lot. <laughs> um, so, of course, the killer is at the camp. Uh, eventually, it starts raining that, that, that night. You have to have rain to give a really, in a film like this, to give a really creepy vibe with the woods and everything just to complement it. Uh, one by one, the characters are knocked off by the killer. You get Ned, who's killed off camera. I was a little disappointed in that. I hate, I didn't like this guy very much. I mean, not that I didn't like the actor. He does a fine job, and he is funny every now and then. The character is, but he's just so obnoxious that when he dies, I was like, fuck, I want to see it. <laughs> he gets killed off camera. <clears throat> Next kill, I believe you have uh, Kevin Bacon. Him and his woman were like fucking or whatever, and she goes off to go to the bathroom, and he's left there by himself. He can really light up a cigarette, and a hand comes up and grabs him by got, grabs him by the mouth, I believe. Not the mouth, maybe the neck or something like that. It's, it's been a day or two since I watched it. And, um, fucking, he, no, it's not the neck. And he gets, he gets speared, like, from under the bed through the neck. And it comes up and blood, like, squirts out and starts, <laughs> just fucking starts shoot, fucking shooting out everywhere through the hole in his neck. It's a cool effect. This is the only effect in the film that looks a little dated for me because I can tell that's obviously not Kevin Bacon's real body. But, um. For the 80s, it's fucking badass, and I just love the idea of it, <laughs> and it's repeated again in some of the other Friday 13s because it's just a really cool kill and a cool look. Uh, but uh, so he's dead. Oh, earlier in the film, you got a scene where when the rain started and Kevin Bacon and his woman were talking, and she was telling Kevin Bacon about a dream she had, and uh, I thought this was a really creepy done scene and good dialogue here, where she's talking about how she has a dream where it was like rain and the rain turned to blood and everything, and the blood washed away and like tiny fucking rivers or something like that, and I'm like, wow, this is really good dialogue here, and really sets the scene, and I enjoy this shit, uh, me personally, I enjoy it, <laughs> but, um, uh, I just talk about stuff like that, because I'm like, critics back in the day are like, this film has no suspense, it doesn't have any real terror in it, it's just shock value, and I'm like, that to me right there is a, is a good little horror setup that relies more on just the dialogue than, uh, that's a a good little horror scene, just a creepy scene with that dialogue. It just relies more on that dialogue than shock value. Shock than shock value. So I'm like, well, fuck you, critics. <laughs> I think you kind of missed the point a couple of times in this film. But um, anyway, so she's in the bathroom. Kevin Bacon's dead. She's in there. Uh, all you get another good suspense here, where she's like, the killer is obviously around there in the bathroom. She's uh, the thanks it's Ned, the practical Joker, and the fucking you see the shadow of the axe behind her. She turns around and. Boom, she gets it slammed right in her face, and it's just done so well, and the suspense, and the camera, like, pans away, and the camera, like, cuts to the light hanging up above her, and it's, like, shaking, and boom, cuts to her, and she falls down, she got the axe planted directly in her forehead, right in her face, and it's just fucking really good effects, and I love it, Tom Savini, this is probably, probably his best effects, well, I take that back, he did the effects for part four, I'll say part four is his best, of, best makeup effects work, in my opinion, that he's done, this would probably, either this or Dawn of the Dead would be, no, either this or Day of the Dead would be second best for me. Well, no, I'll take that back once again. I'd say, I'd say Day of the Dead is my favorite makeup effects of his, followed by Friday the 13th, the final chapter, then this movie. But, uh, uh, so she's dead, she gets an axe in the head, and then there's this other character named Brenda. She's kind of like this, uh, sweet, she seems like the older, like an older woman. And, uh, you get a creepy fucking scene here where she's, like, hearing, uh, uh like cries of a little kid out in the the storm or whatever, and she like fucking gets up and takes a flashlight and goes to check on him. She goes into the archery range, and all at once the lights are turned on, and it's like a lot of build up because she keeps trying to, she keeps hearing a little kid holler saying "Help me, help me." She fucking goes out there, and all at once the lights come on, and she screams, and the screen cuts away, and I'm like, that kind of disappointed me a little bit. I wanted to see her kill because once again, it, well, well that was a lot of build up for me. 
because it took a while to get the her her kill and it was a lot of build up and then you don't don't get to see it. Whenever there's a lot of build up in a horror film or in any film in general, then it kind of just cuts away like that. I'm kind of disappointed a little, but that's more of a personal taste thing. Um, but yeah, so I was a little disappointed in that. Oh, and when Kevin Bacon and his woman are fucking, the camera pans up and laying on the uh, the other bed, like up above him, is fucking Ned's dead body with a throat cut. And uh, I thought that was just a really cool idea. <laughs> and really creepy. Once again, a really creepy scene here. Not just shock value. Hello, critics. <laughs> but anyway, back to the film here. Um, well, enough about the fucking jackass critics. Just I'm just going to talk about the film straight from here on out. So I was a little disappointed in the Brenda death scene, and uh, you got two people left, basically. Well, Steve leaves during the movie and goes to town, uh, goes into town. And um, so you got Bill, which is like Alice's other love interest, and then you got Alice, so the only two left. Um, Steve, com Steve comes back to the camp. He comes back there, and then once again, he gets killed off screen. Now, once again, I'm a little disappointed in that. There's a little bit too many off-screen deaths in this film. With this film's reputation, you'd expect more gore in this film than what there actually is. But the ending final of this film, more than makes up for anything anything of that. Or any, any shortcomings in this film is more than made up for in the final, I mean. Uh, so he gets killed off-screen. He walks up to the killer, obviously, who's shining a light in his face with a flashlight. Uh, he gets stabbed in the chest, so he gets killed off-screen. And then uh, the generator's dying. Bill goes to check it out. Alice wakes up. We don't know what happened to Bill. Uh, Alice goes to check uh, on the generator, and she fucking the door closes, and there's Bill like fucking pinned to the wall with an arrow like shoved directly in his face. And I think maybe one in his neck. And it's like awesome makeup effects, and I just love that look and of his body just fucking nailed there to the wall with arrows in it. That was just so cool. Another Tom Savini outdone himself seeing here. So she screams like anyone would. <laughs> she runs back into the cabin. Uh, ties the, puts shit and every, puts every fucking thing she can find in front of the door. Not once Brenda's body gets fucking thrown through the window, which is another cool scene. In every one of these Jason films, somebody has to break a window. But the killer has to break a window anyway. In this film, the killer is Miss, Mrs. Voorhees. So I don't think I'm ruining it for anybody. Everybody knows Jason's not in this movie. At least any horror fan knows, or real horror fan. Not like a casual. Well, I wouldn't say a real horror fan because what exactly, you know, is a real horror fan, but I'll say the, uh, the older fans who are probably the ones watching this video more than likely know that Jason's not the killer in this movie. But uh, it's just his mom. So she gets thrown through the window and all at once Mrs. Voorhees arrives played by Betsy Palmer. Now Betsy Palmer, I like Betsy Palmer. She's a good actor. She does great here. I know she hated this film and only did it for a paycheck to get a new vehicle or something like that. But uh, I know afterwards she said that now, I mean, nowadays she says that uh, she couldn't see the film for what it was then when she worked on it, but now she sees the film as being a, a good film for what it is. And I'm kind of like, whenever it gets to stuff like that, I'm a little eh, iffy on because I'm like, maybe she just, maybe she's just changing her tune because the film became a big hit. But whatever, she she still does great here, so fuck it. But uh, <clears throat> she does, she shows up. Obviously, she's the killer. The mystery in the film, who was when it was playing up, who was the killer, and everything is completely useless. The mystery is weak in this film. Uh, about who the killer is because there's no way to guess it so it's kind of like a rob of the audience but once again the final here and the creepiness of it and the amazing Betsy Palmer more than makes up for it more than makes up for it uh, so the mystery is kind of a rip off but um you get Betsy Palmer in there and she fucking you obviously know she's the killer because she's the only one left and she starts acting crazy she's like telling her about telling Alice about did you know a young boy drowned here his name was Jason and today is his birthday <laughs> This fucking show, her showing her having flashes of like Jason drowning, saying, Help me, mommy, help me. Which is weird because she never saw like Jason drown. So she's, uh, she says that she was a cook and she was fixing the meals when, while Jason was supposed to have been watched and he ended up drowning. So she never actually saw Jason drown. So this is kind of like what her image of what it would have been like in her mind. And she, you get really cool stuff that Betsy Palmer does where she's like, Fucking thinks she's communicating with Jason's, or thinks Jason's spirit is like communicating through her body. She keeps saying, kill her, mommy, kill her. <laughs> that is just genius. I don't know who came up with that, Betsy Palmer or the director or the writer or whoever, but that was fucking amazing. <laughs> the score in this film was also fantastic with the, <sighs> that is terrific. It's actually saying uh, kill, kill, mom, mom, or whatever, or kill a mommy, and they kind of spliced it with a, with a machine. But it comes out. It comes out great. I love it. <laughs> I love the score of the, of the sound in this film. But uh, this final right here is a whole lot of fun. 
Uh, Mrs. Voorhees obviously is the killer now. She's packing him a knife, <laughs> later on a machete. She's trying to kill Alice. Alice manages to knock her out with a poker. Alice gets the fuck out of Dodge. Uh, Mrs. Voorhees chases after. They fight again. Alice has a gun, but she can't get the bullets to it because they're in a, another drawer and they're locked. Which kind of a dumbass puts their bullets in another place, not even with their own, not even in their gun or next to their gun or fucking close to where they can get to them, but whatever. Um, and so uh, she ends up knocking Mrs. Voorhees down again right here, and then um, she's chasing after. Well, Mrs. Voorhees gets up, starts chasing after Alice again. You get terrific uh, focus shots on the moon and focus shots on Betsy Palmer's face, saying "Kill her, mommy! Don't let her get away. There's no place to hide." <laughs> I'm like, that's terrific acting. They play it up so good. It's wonderful to see in uh, this film. Just this chase, this ending, uh, well, this ending final, the chasing and the fucking uh, just action of it is terrific and well filmed. Sean Cunningham, he's not a very good director. He's not. But uh, this film was helped uh, by a good horror script. And, um, well, he's a, he's a, he's a good director. He's decent. He's not bad or anything, but uh, he's not. This is this is his best film. This is really the only good film he's ever done. But um, so uh, Mrs. Voorhees is still chasing after Alice. Uh, Alice, man, she Alice ha like locks herself in this fucking. Uh, well, Alice locks herself up in this room, and then Mrs. Voorhees manages to bark through. Alice knocks her out with a fucking uh, pan, I believe, or a skillet. Knocks her out, and once again, she's knocked her out for like the third time here. I don't know about you, but if somebody was trying to kill me with a fucking machete, and I finally, I knocked them out three times, once they was down for the third time, I'd probably have bashed their head in, but that's just me, so after three times of knocking around, I'm like, eh, getting a little repetitive, so Alice leaves again after that, uh, she makes it outside, Mrs. Voorhees comes up behind her, and you like see her reflection in the water, where Alice is like bending down towards the water, and she sees her reflection coming up behind it, so they get into a fight again, Alice jerks out a paddle, Mrs. Voorhees fucking slices the paddle in half with the machete, they get into a fight. She's like fucking bitch slapping Alice, and she's like hitting her head against the against the ground. Alice manages to get the machete, and you get the best kill, the best kill in the entire Friday Thirteenth franchise. This is, I don't think this film has I don't think this film has the best kills in the franchise, but it has the number one best kill in the franchise. Alice gets the fucking machete, and then close up on Betsy Palmer's face, she's like. <laughs> And Alice comes around and goes, fucking motherfucker, phew, <laughs> fatality. I just wish somebody would add that in in a video on YouTube and just put fucking fatality <laughs> with the letters like popping up top of the screen. She fucking slices off Betsy Palmer's head. Epic, badass. <laughs> Best kill, entire franchise, period, in my opinion. So after that, you kind of get something weird here where after uh, Mrs. Voorhees' dad, Alice decides to get into a canoe and go, like fucking go out in the water. And I'm like, okay. Well, I guess she's so stressed out now that everything's over. She just wants to get away from all the violence and everything. And just decides to get in the canoe and go out into the water. And I'm like, okay. I, I guess. I guess I can kind of buy that. But anyway, she gets out. That's another small nitpick. Doesn't mean shit. She gets out in the canoe. Gets out into the water. Um, then you get a dream sequence here. It's a, a rip off of the dream sequence from Carrie. The ending of that one. But similar scenes like this have been done before with a final jump scare like this. Even before Carrie. Um, so you, uh, she has a dream here where the fucking police arrive and everything's safe. It's playing this sweet sounding music. She's like twirling her little fingers through the water. Everything's okay. <laughs> you think something's going to happen, but you know, wait a couple minutes, wait a few seconds and nothing still ain't happened. She's like, okay, maybe everything just is okay. Not once fucking Jason leaps out of the water. Young Jason, boy Jason, leaps out of the fucking water, comes up, grabs her around the neck, pulls her backwards into the water. The whole canoe like flips over. It's like that right there, automatic. That's automatic four stars right there. That right there just sealed the deal. Movie perfect, perfect for what it is. Perfect in your face slasher film with real, with decent good, decent to really good suspense. That right there just seals the deal. <clears throat> Next scene, you got Alice waking up in the hospital. Now this, I was a little, little. This bugged me a little because I'm like, the police. How? Why the fuck did the police show up and find her and take her to the hospital? I mean, I understand the police would obviously take her to the hospital after they're seeing all the dead people there, but why the fuck did the police even go to the camp? But uh, once again, that's a small nitpick. You know, that goes into the who gives a fuck territory. I mean, <laughs> that has no bearing on the quality of this movie at all. That's just a minor nitpick for me. I'm the dumbass nitpick master. <laughs> but that has no bearing on the movie at all. I mean, honestly, that falls in, like I've said, the who gives a fuck category. But uh, so she's in the hospital, and you get the, the ending here, which I love, which is really, really sweet. 
and with a nice little tune playing where uh, she's like, what well, about the boy? Is he dead too? And the police are like, we didn't find any boy, ma'am. And she goes, focus like, straight in on her face for the camera. And she's like, and he's still there. <laughs> and it focuses in on the water and you got like these little bubbles or something like that coming up that kind of maybe might be air bubbles. But uh, the scene is supposed to be a dream. So I guess obviously they're not air bubbles. But it's still cool to think about that. And then, bam, you get a cute little sweet sad tune playing. And that's the end of the movie. Perfect film for what it is. Perfect slasher film, in your face slasher film. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is at the end of the film, when Alice is running away from Mrs. Voorhees, she get like all the, you get like fucking her finding bodies of the, some of the people that's dead. Like she opens up Mrs. Voorhees' jeep to get in, I guess, to try to drive away. Annie's body is in the vehicle dead, and then you get Steve Christie's body who like fucking falls out from a tree, hanging there with a knife in his chest. That was cool too. I like that. Uh. But yeah, this is a really good film for what it is, this, uh, which it's an in-your-face, balls-to-the-wall slasher film with really good gore, and for that, it's four stars. It's really good. Uh, Halloween is better than this film, but the Friday 13th franchise as a whole is much better than the Halloween franchise. That film just turned to shit. Just pure shit. They didn't know, it's like they had no idea what to do with that franchise. I just couldn't think of anything to do. But, um, but yeah, uh, when I say Halloween is better than this movie, I honestly don't think Halloween is that much better than this film. I don't think Halloween is the best horror film. I think it's one of the best, but for me, I think The Exorcist is probably. Is, I think The Exorcist is better than Halloween, but I also think The Exorcist is better than Friday the 13th as well. But that's just me. But yeah, this is still a terrific film, and I do love this franchise, and I do like this franchise of Friday. I do like the Friday the 13th franchise better than I do the Halloween franchise. Um, but yeah, this is a really good film. Four stars. Definitely check it out if you're a slasher movie fan or a horror movie fan. If you haven't seen this film, wh what are you doing? You're missing out. <laughs> but in all seriousness, this is a really good film. I definitely recommend you check it out. Um, and just the idea of it, like a mother who just went crazy and is like killing all these people at this camp because she's just taking her rage out on her because of her because of her son died. She's taking like the rage out, uh, you know, getting it out of her system by slicing everybody to pieces because her only child died who was deformed. Uh, that's kind of like really fucking sad and hits a chord with people much more than a, well Michael Myers him being like a pure evil character like that is slightly more interesting but he can't really hit like an emotional chord to really connect with a person like the story of Jason can with him being like a like more of a sad sympathetic story um, of him drowning like that and his mom trying to get revenge for his death that just hits more of a chord with people in my opinion I think but yeah this is a really good film uh, I definitely recommend you check it out, and I'll see you guys again with a review for Friday the 13th Part 2. And I hope you guys have a really good day.